Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We'll just give a minute or two for extra people to come in. Before we go ahead and introduce what's going on tonight, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Jade. I am one of the programmers and facilitators of the Magnum Emerging Writers in Residence course. I joined Magnum initially as a digital and archives trainee, and I currently work on the Magnum magazine as a deputy editor. Um, by Bariam also worked on the course, if you want to Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bayram. I am uh, the Magnum Learn coordinator and I'm the workshop coordinator with Jade. Uh, as similar to Jade, I joined Magnum through the New Museum School uh, program, which is a, a program uh, curated by uh, Culture and, and uh, Create Jobs. And currently I have been working for Magnum for one and a half years. Great, so this, um, welcome. This is Susan Macellis in conversation with Sanil Shah. It's the keynote lecture for the Magnum Emerging Writers in Residence program. And that's a five week course inviting people interested in photographic writing to propose, research and produce a text for the Magnum website based on photographs from the archive. The course makes a case for the importance of quality writing and visual literacy for the photography industry for voices who traditionally and at present have limited access. Um, so before I introduce Susan and Sunil, um, I just wanted to give a big welcome to everyone listening in today. Um, that includes the current participants of the course that we kicked off yesterday, um, there's six of you. Um, it includes Magnum staff and friends of staff, um, includes some tutors who are working on the course with us. And it also includes some of the applicants of the course who weren't ultimately invited to take part, um, of which there were initially 200. Um, and if that's something that applies to you, I just wanted to acknowledge the time and effort that you put into applying. Um, for anyone who's not aware of the application process, um, everyone made really considered and beautiful responses to three Magnum images, one by Susan, one by Ernest Cole, and one by Peter Marlowe. And they all nominated one other photographer to give written responses to. We received many excellent pieces of writing and I can't thank you all enough. Um, so the structure for today is gonna be that um, Sana, uh, Susan gives her 15 minute presentation of her work then Sano will give a 15 minute presentation. They'll then be in conversation for 20 minutes. And then at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for questions. And that's from either the participants who'll be dialing in or audience members. So if you want to type us in a question, please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we'll be able to propose some of those questions to Susan and Sano. So now I just wanted to introduce our speakers. Um, Susan Micellis, she's a photographer and photographic educator. She joined Magnum Photos in 1976. She's well known for her first major photo essay, Carnival Strippers, which followed showgirls on their travels across country fairs in New England, USA. And in the mid 1970s, she made Prince Street Girls, a series documenting the exploits of young women in her home neighborhood of Little Italy, New York. At the end of that decade, she completed the Project Nicaragua, her coverage of the insurrection in that country. And then in 1997, she finished her six year project curating a 100 year photographic history of Kurdistan, um, which was released as a book, Kurdistan in the Shadow of History. And over the following years, the project evolved into an online archive at akakurdistan.com and took form as a traveling exhibition. And Susan will be telling us more about that in her presentation. Anil Shah is an artist, educator and writer who's based in Oxford, UK. He's associate editor of American Suburb X, a photography and visual culture platform, and he's current PhD candidate at Central St. Martins in London. 
Susan Sarnell have drawn on oral history and collaborative methods of archiving in their work that explores the history of communities. They're both multidisciplinarians, they've been documentarians, interviewers and researchers, and that's why we're really pleased to invite them to share their practices and to be in discussion with us today. Um, so Susan, I'm delighted to ask you to kick us off by Great. presenting Kurdistan. Yeah, so hi everyone, uh, and thanks Jaden Bai and Sunil who we are meeting for the first time, which makes this really exciting. Um, let's see if this works. Um, actually, I wanted to read something. I'm not a writer, and I think I have to say that because I feel this is leading to people who will be inspired to write, but I became, I work with words, but I, I don't normally write them. But in order to introduce this quickly, because this is going to be a fast journey through a process, um, I just wanted to read something that came for the introduction of this book. And, and it's unusual for me to do an introduction actually, um, but I felt as if you were to see the book, you'd understand. I wanted to draw from the diary of my notes in the process and also anchor it in the ideas that were evolving. Some of which I'll share as we look at the work, but I just wanted to read something quickly that'll give you the foundation for some of the thinking. And this is just a tiny excerpt from the intro. What interested me was the intersection and interplay between those who shaped Kurdish life and the lives of the chroniclers who pictured them, the photographers and those photographed, the, the, the points of cultural exchange, how the various protagonists cross one another's paths, both left their marks on Kurdish history. So this set me on a path to place myself in a timeline of image makers. And another little section towards the end of the intro, I say, I can't escape the tradition of the colonial foreigner. I travel and collect, take and treasure, classify, consume and possess. Yet I also feel the need to repatriate what I uncover as I attempt to reconstruct the past from scattered fragments. So this just gives you a little bit of a framework of the, the scale of this project is, um, I'm just showing you here literally the launch point. And I'm, I'm doing that because I want you to feel the process. Um, this is long ago for most of you, 1991, 180,000 refugees fleeing from Northern Iraq into Turkey. And of course I did not make this photograph but it was the trigger that led me to go with this feeling no, knowing nothing about Kurdistan as most Americans did not. Uh, this is long before the Gulf War. So I'm gonna continue just to give you um, kind of a shape of this journey. You know, this, the Saddam Hussein's troops had retreated from the Northern part of Iraq. I kind of think of myself when I go into the world, it's very much like going into the field, much like an archive. In other words, it's, you have no idea what you're gonna find. You may be drawn to stay longer, you may, feel you need to return and, and you never know what you're gonna make or contribute. And I think that's a very primary part of my practice in almost all the work I've done. So this is really sharing a bit of the process of how the discovery and the engagement and the way the concept evolved into what, what you'll, you'll, you know, you'll see down the path, but there are four stages. And the first stage is really about documentation and, and then collection repatriation and then shifting forms. And so that's the fundamental structure I'm just gonna try and reveal very quickly. In this early documentation as a photographer, I knew about the Anfal campaign in which Saddam's, Saddam had attempted to annihilate the Kurdish population. I was looking for visible evidence and you can barely see this perhaps the, the uh, scar on the, from a bullet in the back of Tamar Abdullah other kinds, he was a sole survivor of a village massacre. There's a lot of the, the image right before of the ruins of a destroyed village. Um, this notion of digging and seeing became the real metaphor. In other words, documenting the present, but how do you reveal the past? Who are the pictures for? You know, what's the purpose for whom, do, what do they serve? For whom do they serve? So these, this photograph with the woman bringing the image she carried around her neck of her son 
was part of that stimu you know, stimulus. I'm making an image, but I don't know what's happened in the past, who he is. And that's part of the stimulus to realizing that digging was gonna become the metaphor for this whole project. It leads me into wondering more about who the Kurdish, the Kurdish history I know nothing of. And where do you find it? I'm very aware of the fact that people from the Kurdish community have told me about travelers, earlier travelers. I want to know who took the pictures then. And of course, most of them have taken, a, taken those pictures away. So actually, I begin part of my search in uh, the Royal Geographic Society. I find this album. And again, writing is interesting. I don't, you can't maybe read the detail, but the idea that this woman, Marianne O'Connor in the 1920s went to Kurdistan as a traveler, I have no idea, and they have no idea who she was and what led her to that travel. The only evidence we have is in these little notations in her album. So that kind of writing, what does it, what does it tell us and what does it leave absent? In the, in the process of finding such an object or singular images made by different travelers who I, whose uh, trails I was trying to follow, it led me back into this next stage of repatriation and collection. So it's, in, in other words, finding things afar, how do the people from the very community it has come from, it was made and taken away from. And so this process begins to be moving across borders, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, where the principal large populations, including then the diaspora later, but these simultaneous histories evolving and wanting to bring back what I'm following, I'm, I'm finding in archives, Western archives. And, you know, at the same time, the Kurdish community bringing things back, mostly in Xerox form, they begin to share their family collections. And so I'm reproducing the photographs that they offer as part of a collective history. And I'm, I'm using this, what, what barely exists anymore, sadly, is positive negative film. So, Anyone who's contributing is seeing what has been given and, and by their own neighbors, perhaps. And I'm working from one backyard to another or house to house, village to village with, with um, various Kurdish partners. Um, and really it, it's where this process is beginning to open up the stories. So the stories that surround the images that help contextualize them. I mean, just this is just an example, you know, this idea of how do you protect historical memory from erasure? You know, who was in the photo? Who took the photo? Why was it saved? It's, it's a narrative of fragments. And in this case, this is an artifact from Kurdistan. Uh, in, I mean, a Kurdish family in Kazakhstan. And the father writes around the photograph who everyone in the photograph has become. So it's not about the event, which is what I'm also curious about, what had led the family to be together at that moment. It turns out they had lived in Southeast Turkey and been forced to migrate to Kazakhstan under Stalin. But that's another story. He wants to tell me the story of who they are now. You know, other kinds of writing that it, I think the obscurity of writing. So, you know, Kurdish, Culture doesn't ha, has a home, but not a homeland, right? And they have no national archives. So this question of how you gather the bits and pieces and where are they embedded? This is a document behind a photograph. The photograph's made in Turkey. The, the background is the CIA primary documentation, of course, blackened out, but referring to the event that you see in the photograph. So I'm looking for different ways to contextualize, not, and give, a feeling of the layers of history, making visual objects at the same time that speak to each other. I'm also gathering sources. So the you know primary sources like published articles at the time. In 1979, I actually remember seeing this photograph on the front cover of the New York Times. It circulated through magazines globally, the killing of uh, two, uh, two Kurdish young men uh, just as Khomeini came into power in Iran. Um, and at the time, I remember thinking, as a photographer, would I have ever been able to make that photograph? You know, I was placing myself in literally looking through the lens that the image maker, uh, who was anonymous, and the, the picture circulated in AP anonymously. Nobody knew who had made it. 
and um, it took decades for him to reveal himself and feel safe, safe enough to do so. But what interested me was finding out that the mother of the two boys who were killed in this execution lived in LA. So her story becomes as important as the way that event is recorded in the public, public arena. So just in terms of process, I'm gathering the bits and pieces into in whatever form I have, primary materials are complementing the Xeroxes that I'm collecting. As you can see, everything gets marked up. I'm traveling and working with an international group of scholars, a network that I could never have worked on this without, um, the diaspora community throughout Europe. Um, and again, I'm also interested in what Kurds who have left the principal area of their homelands to, uh, to Europe and other places have carried with them. So what do they take as they're forced to run? The, the book itself is, an, is this object that, you know, tries to give you a feeling as a form of um, a family album, really. And I wanted you to feel time moving through the book. So literally the color shifts from being a sepia tone that you would know of photographs from a hundred years ago to a cooler black and white tone, color comes in at a certain moment. And I, the, the whole idea of a book um, the challenge of a book was really that it was also fixed and linear. And of course, many of these stories are parallel, but I wanted you to feel the artifacts that tell the story. There's a lot of, there are a lot of layers of writing embedded in it. Um, just quickly, another kind of page from the book where you see literally the handwriting from the backs of the photographs or the passport that was carried by Major Noel, a British um, British colonial officer at the time researching Kurdistan, trying to give this feeling of where the history is being made and coming from. Um, the book also moves then to another form of an exhibition showcasing the artifacts. And the more interesting thing was coming up with the idea of a site specific room every time the exhibition moves. So this is in Holland, where by that time, this is 98, I think, uh, 99, uh, the book came out in 97. Um, the Kurdish community in Holland brought photographs to add to the walls. And, and as they did that, we began to have the capacity to digitize and scan those photographs. We didn't, they, that really led to this kind of idea that a book was fixed and that there was an ongoing history to capture. So people bringing the work to the walls, scanning it, of course, led to the next stage, which is this notion of the a AKA Kurdistan. Um, and it's a website that was designed 98. It's very primitive. Um, AKA Kurdistan, AKA meaning also known as, this is the homeland that the Kurds claimed, but of course overlaps with Southeast Turkey, which has been fought over. Syria, you've been reading about what's happened there in terms of the Kurdish population, uh, et cetera. So this is, um, the website offers a, a, a way of accessing in cyberspace stories that come from all parts of that region along different timelines. And again, it's very simple. It's horizontal scrolls or vertical scrolls, which is all about what we could do at the time. So we don't, this is before you have Google Maps and before their iPhones, but you can see writing becomes as important. So these are the people are sending in stories and the, the, the compression of the story, the visual and the textual um, is really, you know, when I think of what technology does today, it's what we can do on Zoom. This was very early technology. Another aspect of it was the notion of an unknown ongoing image archive that you could share and people could ongoing participate in identifying unknown events and people um, so I saw it also as a tool to, to exchange knowledge between archivists and scholars, community members, photographers, etc. But of course, with the notion it's never complete, it's always reactivated through interventions. And I guess this is, speaks to that, the books that you see on that wall, this is in the Jeux de Palme a couple of years ago, what was contributed to the website becomes a small book with the invitation to be held and read by someone uh, coming to that wall with the idea of an ongoing gathering of fragments of writing and images to express the experience of a global diaspora today. 
Um, this was held, this is a book that was right, you are part of the story. Uh, I sort of like featuring this because this was done in London in the last workshop when the show was at the uh, Photographer's Gallery. And each time I am able to show the work, I try to have a workshop which opens up new stories that people want to share. Of course, um, if they so choose, I think this idea of doing history in this particular way with the community and sharing the multi multiple perspectives over time is the thing that continues. It sustains me and, and hopefully has value as a contribution to the community. So thanks. Well, wow, thank you so much, Susan, for compressing. <laughs> a, a Zoom should a race through time. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's really nice to hear about how your questioning of the role of the photographer led into this, the way that you know that the end result was going to be, and how you were exploring how the absence of pictures led you to find all of these other routes into filling in the absence. Thank you. Um, mm. Now, I'm sure everyone will have loads of questions, but we will first um, have a look at Sarnil's work. So if you'd like to present your... Thanks, yeah. Susan. Thanks, Jade. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to just start with um, some thoughts that I had today with a bit of a kind of preamble, I suppose. Um, so the archive for me began with my family's pictures and cine films, saved by my dad and provided as an evening's entertainment with the Super 8 projector. As an Indian family living in rural Oxfordshire, away from our extended family and the Gujarati communities of London and Leicester, these pictures were an important part of our link to family and community. We arrived in the UK in 1972 after a 90-day expulsion decree by Idi Amin, with only a suitcase of belongings allowed per person, only essential items were allowed. Some will remember the news images of Asian refugees stepping off planes, cold and bewildered in the autumn of 1972, being welcomed by the Salvation Army with blankets, tea and biscuits. These photographs and films were essential as the record of our lives. A vital sense of identification was created and maintained by them. As I got older, these pictures became more and more interesting to me. As a photography undergraduate, I became interested not only in what the photographs tell us, but what they don't tell us. The photographs of my family album became the source for how I could reassemble my past and perhaps in a way they could tell me who I was. Later in my career, as you will see, I started to discover how images could create communities, not only in the way they become the departure point for conversations, both pub, private and public, but how the internet and the digital age erase distance and compress time, so, so the immediacy of the image becomes part of its value. Now we are able to post images straight after they are taken, we can scan or re-photograph images and share them in an instant. We can form groups and communities with common interests. Instagram, as much as being a platform intended to sell us things, has its concept rooted in the knowledge that systems, uh, sorry, that, that humans need to congregate around images. Expressions are made, consensus is formed, dialogue is created and learning can happen. We live in an age where social justice is one of the key motivations for the production of images. And so with the ability to share thoughts, to assert identities, to challenge histories, to discover who we are now, the public image economy becomes crucial and critical terrain. Archives are typically institutional and yet we now have the power to generate and manage our own archives. They can be sites of learning, resistance, contestation, and provide revelation of new stories and histories. But power resides implicitly in the status of the archive's architecture, and it could only be contested if it's publicly accessible. It, on, it is only through public access that new knowledge and revis, revised ethics can come into effect. Otherwise, we blindly accept the implicit power and its rendition of a singular past. 
We as critical, critical producers, editors and consumers of images are helping to slowly dismantle the patriarchal order and the white supremacist logic that upholds and provides the foundation of not only archives, but of photography and photographic production itself. I believe at least in terms of archives, a critical analysis, the refreshing of these archives and the generation of new archives under the ideological lens of the present is how we deal with a lost, violent or problematic past. Now, I, there were a number of thoughts that kind of came to me this, today about this. And I think that it's kind of important for me to mention that my initial kind of interest in, in archives actually started when I was a lot younger. When I was, when I was a little boy, my, you know, when we came over from the, from Uganda, like the, the box of photos and cine films were our, were an evening's entertainment. We would sit down and my father used to go through the images and go through the cine films and tell us who was where and what was going on. It was, it was for them a kind of like a, a capture of, of, of their past life. And when I went to university and I started becoming interested in pictures, I began this project called Uganda Stories. And it was based very much on, on looking at that archive of images that we had and to kind of start trying to thought or think about what they meant in terms of what we lost and what we left behind. Because for the, for the Indian community and especially with my family, it was a kind of like a new beginning coming to the UK. There was a sense that, you know, there was possibly sort of like an economic gain to be made out of coming to the UK and starting off new. And one of the things that I felt that there was, there was this kind of loss and trauma of the actual event of being expelled from Uganda that wasn't really talked about anymore. And it, and it became that that became kind of interesting to me. When, when I interviewed my, my, my dad and my uncles, about what life was like, you know, they often had all the kind of nice stories of how amazing it was and how, how life was so perfect, how Uganda was such an idyllic country to sort of live in. Um, but, you know, there was a lot under the surface, there was a lot of um, pain there as well. Um, you know, my uncle had one of his best friends murdered by the military. My, da my dad was captured by the military at one point and imprisoned. My mum used to tell me stories of when you know, in the evenings there was a curfew and they really didn't know um, whether anybody would come home again if they had gone out. Um, you know, there were stories of like going to the airport and, you know, on the way like to the UK and, and literally being frightened that, 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 you know, you'd get robbed, you know. So all the jewellery that, um, you know, everybody had was like hidden in and sometimes in, in in food, it was like hidden in food. So there was like all of these stories that people weren't really talking about. Um, and I, it was those things that kind of interested me and got me thinking. So there was another aspect of Uganda stories that was quite interesting for me. And, and some of that was to do with um, the our place as Indians in Africa. I mean, one of the reasons that we were there was because of, of of like imperial interests of, of British is of the British rule that kind of occupied much of East Africa and other parts of Africa too. But you know, initially my my family came over as as workers that were kind of um, encouraged to go to East Africa to sort of earn money. And for the British, it was very much about um, you know finding um, a loyal a loyal workforce in the in the Indians who had already been colonized for such a long time to go to Uganda and then and go to Kenya and to set up the infrastructure and something I found out about that is that a lot of that is to do with the collection of taxes so that the incorporation of a kind of political and governmental system in East Africa was was essentially um, administered by by Asians that had, that had kind of come had landed there but also a lot of the kind of exchange of trade Asians were already in East Africa long before the um, the 20 early 20th century and you know there was a lot of infrastructure already there as well but the the, the railroads in in uh, in East Africa were built largely by um, indentured labors that were brought over from India in the in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. 
So there was a lot, there was a lot more to that history of us being in Uganda there than meet the eye. Um, of course, there was a family collection, there was a family, a set of family stories there, but there was for me, there's there was this subtext of that, this kind of colonial kind of encounter. And also this kind of the the play of kind of social hierarchies that were in place. Um, a lot of my family would often, you know, like the way they would speak of, of black Africans in, in Uganda was for me, it was quite problematic because there was this kind of tiered system of, of, of society in place where, um, you know, black indigenous Africans in Uganda were at the kind of bottom of society. And then there were the Indians kind of like operating administration roles and uh, uh, running trade. Um, and then there were the British at the top or the Europeans that were kind of overseeing kind of the law and the government and the, and the, and the state itself. Um, and that all changed when um, Uganda became independent, when Kenya became independent. And, you know, in, in the kind of change towards this kind of um, um, nation building um, and identity formation for uh, you got, um, African nations, um, there was this kind of uh, animosity towards the Asians, you know, in the same way that there would have been animosity towards the colonizer. Um, and, you know, we, I can actually see that kind of trajectory of how we ended up leaving. Um, uh, obviously, obviously, it was through quite an sort of extreme means of being expelled and asked to leave in 90 days, but we, we had to go. And um, luckily, my father had a British passport, so we, we came to the UK. Um, so, you know, that for me, there was also this kind of, you know, these kind of like political and social political elements that could be explored through this project. In um, a few years ago, I, I, you know, initially showed it at New Art, New Art Exchange. And then a couple of years ago, um, the Pitt Rivers contacted me um, and asked me to um, hold the ex uh, exhibition of this project there as well. Um, and as you know, the, I mean, the Pitt Rivers, um, most of you will know, is um, quite a kind of um, an organization that's built around colonialism. Um, it's, um, it has a kind of problematic relationship to the artifact. And um, it was actually an opportunity that I thought I couldn't miss, to be honest, because one of the things that I think I do in terms of image making, um, which kind of contrasts um, in the way that Susan directly looks at images, is is certainly that I, I decontextualize the image from its provenance. You know, for me, the, the act of, of appropriating that image is an act of like resisting um, authority in a sense, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way in which I can counter, create a counter narrative or create a counter subjectivity to um, what the way in which images normally flow and operate and, mean so for me it was it was it was an act of kind of resistance to be in the pit rivers and to use these images as symbolic or as metaphors for or way more of the kind of family personal elements and and created more of a of a, of a relationship to metaphor And this, you know, it occurred to me that this may be difficult for um, the Pitt Rivers in some respects, because much of what they hold is an archive. It has metadata, it has tags, it has information that's applied to the image. So to strip all that away is, is you know, for me, an artistic gesture, but also it's a gesture to kind of re resist. I wanted to mention quickly that I did a project with a community group called the Asian Centre in North London in 2013. And it was a project called Making Home, which was about um, working with the Ugandan Asian community and generating oral histories. Um, and what this was very much about was about, you know, it wasn't necessarily just about me, but, I was kind of like um, involved in kind of pulling together a team um, that together we kind of like researched this history, we pulled together an ex exhibition, we generated oral histories and we worked with a number of like institutional archives to again kind of like mirror my approach to sort of 
decontextualization, but at the same time, inviting the community to participate in the construction of this work. Um, this was shown at the Royal Geographic Society in 2013, and uh, it was a funded project. And I think there was around 40, 40 of us involved in it altogether. Um, but it was very much about kind of the post sort of migrant experience of Asians in the UK um, coming to the UK in the 1970s. Um, and also the 40th year in 2013, it was the 40th year of the Asian expulsion. Um, also just being involved in a, a couple of projects that to do with diasporic uh, art experiences. Um, this was part of uh, Don't Mix Me Up in Oxford. Working with images, but all with art with images, but also um, working with artists that are using who, who are questioning the idea of the artifact and the role of the artifact. Kind of brings me up to quite recently where we was involved in a project called Activating Our Archives with Modern Art Oxford, um, and this was very much a, a project about the 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 transition between physical and digital image, about questioning what an archive was and to kind of ask participants to kind of like engage in image, in image editing and image um, expression through identifying what for them was their own archive. And I'm just going to, um, I think probably would be a good idea is to show you a video. I'm hoping, hoping we've got time. Jade, how am I doing for time? We're just running a minute or two over, but um, if you want to show the video and then we can wrap up after that and we'll move on to the conversation after that. Okay, I'll do that. So um, just very quickly, this, this project was a response to Akram Satari's, um, uh, the script, which was shown at New Art Exchange and then Modern Art Oxford and the Turner Contemporary. Um, and in it, he uses the kind of internet as a source of image, of image, of identifying image tropes, which then become expressions of, of a, like an a Arabic, um, male Arabic identity. I'll just um, play the video. Activating Our Archives is a community engagement program run here at Modern Art Oxford. We are a group of 20 participants who are engaging with the digital image. The aim of the project has been to expand the notion of what the archive is. And in doing that, we've been looking at digital archives, found images and family pictures, and how our relationship to photography has changed through digital culture. It relates to my project in the sense that I'm dealing with my own archive as a mother. I want to create a visual narrative of my motherhood experience that is not necessarily beautiful, but also shockingly authentic. This, uh, this piece of work is a, a fictional photo album. These images come from a wide range of archives um, and it's in response to uh, the fact that I don't or ne have never had a family album. I have inserted myself in some of these images and, and not in others. Um, and that is a purposeful expression of identity. Uh, photos are edited, taken out, torn, but they all represent um, a fictional narrative. I'm particularly interested in um, how people engage with museum cultures. When I first started working on this project, I showed a photo of myself from reflected in the glass of a museum exhibit. Was something to do with archives going on out there more than our Oxford. I was a former photographer in Spain and in London in a charity shop I found uh, photos of uh, one family where a little blonde girl appears and what I've been doing is basically going to every single spot that I could find through all these years and then trying to take a picture in the actual times. As a group we've created a digital archive uh, using Padlet and been using Instagram as well 
social media platforms and we've been pulling together images which relate to ourselves and also the community around us. So far we have, through the hashtag on Instagram, um, uploaded over 450 posts and we've had people from all over the world um, adding to that. This image is no longer available. It is a one-day event where we will be showing all the work that's been completed by the participants. We'll be showing parts of the digital archive and we've invited artists and academics to come and get involved in the conversation. 2019, it's all about quantum drop displays, yeah? Forget the old stuff, this is the new stuff, yeah? Standout moment has been really to see the transformation in some of the participants and how their understanding has gone from being quite a one that's related to the photographic image to something that's much more to do with the digital image and its distribution across the internet. The online aspect of the project was, it was interesting for me because um, what I've been doing is looking at old archive images. So people donate archives to me and now they get scanned and put into the public domain. Um, so this seemed like a hands-on opportunity to work on my own photographs and contribute to a creative project. It's been incredibly amazing because I think motherhood is lonely and in the past five years I've been just doing this project on my own uh, so I wasn't able to talk to anybody about it until this project. This sort of collaborative nature of the workshops where you bring work and you talk about it um, has enabled me to think about new directions to take this work. So that's the thing about this workshop. In here I haven't got like second questions about why I'm doing this. It's like a normal thing. They even see it like quite curious and that's something that pushed me to keep going with it. It's been a really lovely experience. Um, the participants we've had have all been very open-minded, really um, approachable and engaged. It's been great to see how interesting this whole subject matter is. Um, we're only touching the surface. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sana. I think I'll leave that there. Thank you. Um, it was really great to hear you draw out all of these elements and the tensions between how f photographs are material and they do things for us, What, how do they connect us with people, and the ways that um, in this digital age, these um, the social media and the internet can present a perceived dilution to that, but really how do they in fact allow us to engage and connect together more. And um, I also liked hearing about um, the lure of the family photograph and how that connects to the universality of something that you create when you compile these things together. And I'm sure it's something that um, Susan can relate to um, having seen all of these personal photographs. Um, so I wondered, Susan, if you had any questions for Sunil now, if you wanted to ask him one question and then um, Sunil could answer and then respond with a question. Well, what I find so interesting is actually, I feel like I was just in one of the workshops that could have been the workshop that I would have done in relation to the exhibition of Kurdistan, because of course people bringing their own family photographs and beginning to remember what's in them or outside of them, as you pointed to, is you know the beginning of one kind of storytelling. You know what's been lost in the memory. Um, but I think I'm I'm fascinated by both the similar points that we have and the points of difference, as you emphasize decontextualizing. And I I think it's very different if you have your own family archive, your own photographs that you feel you can cut and trim and re, you know, manipulate and my sense of respect for the object. So we both work with artifacts, but I feel uh, the artifact has some kind of integrity that I want to be felt. I want the history of the artifact to be felt outside of myself and my own understanding or interpretation of it. So I'm interested in just this idea of both decontextualizing because it is all decontextualized and the notion of 
the recontextualizing, which could be in the writing as we both have done, or through the memory work that you were doing with your, your family in Uganda and I was doing with various people throughout uh, the Kurdish diaspora. You know, ultimately we're constructing, in neither case are they truly authoritative histories. They're both, um, I would say, in the spirit of something between memory work. Uh, I like to think of the work as almost a mosaic. I don't think of the work as anything final. I think of it as, that's what the, why bookmaking is so problematic, in fact, because it feels so fixed. So my question is really more, you know, just, you know, where do you, it's interesting, we both have this kind of draw to bringing people together to, un, to activate the archive. I, I use the word intervene in the archive, but actually we're, we're starting from different points because your, your archive is your family's possession and nothing existed except through the bits and pieces that could be pulled together. So it's not a place you go to the way an official archive exists, like the public records office, which I loved in London, but it's a very different thing. It's a, it's a thing, it's a place, it's a destination. It's, you have to unpack. So I think of where does your family album live beyond the walls of what you share in the Oxford? Where does it go back to? which has been a big question for me about the work went back to the families. It doesn't live in one location beyond the book or the traveling exhibition. You know, is it an archive? It's a collection. I mean, how do you think about its temporality and its, you know, ongoing life? Yeah, it's a really, I mean, it, it, you know, everything you're saying kind of, you know, reflects the kind of complexity of what images do when they circulate, what we, how we intervene with them, how we engage with them, and what we choose the, to do with them. In 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 many in many ways, the the photograph as a document is is there is a there is a kind of um, um, there is a sense of officialness about the photographic document, but also there is a sacredness to it as well. I think that through culturally photographs have become sacred um, and that if you were to do something to an image or to remove information from an image, it's almost like people don't get it. People be like, why would you want to do that? Um, I, you know, I've had some occasions where I've shown my work to my family members and they, they're like, for the first thing they want to know who's in the picture where was it shot or that kind of information so the image does a lot of work around its kind of its provenance its its meaning you know in terms of the family in terms of the community or um in in terms of who's in there because you know as we know that one of the first questions for the image is what is it and who is in there like who is that you know that that is the very important part of it um, and in, in all the work that I've done, um, there isn't a completely denial of that. That, that process is always happening. And it was, those conversations always circulate. And they are interesting, absolutely interesting. I think when, when, as an artist, when I then pull images from an archive to then to change, to transform in some way, it, I think that's moving it into a different kind of aesthetic register to express something else, you know, to express some feeling I have about that history or some connection I have to some aspect of its kind of political status or something like that. So I, th I think that um, I think we both ha have that. I, we, I think we have probably very similar conversations. And just as you say that you know, you you could kind of see yourself even being in some of those images and those from the video. Um, absolutely true, because when you get together with a group of people and you stand, you sit there and you look at images, it's it's great. There's nothing like it. It's nothing like seeing people's different interpretations, seeing what people bring to that conversation. It is mm -hmm. is magic. I mean, it must have been for you when you were working on on your um in your workshops well and i just was thinking of the parallel because you were rediscovering tracing the family history that 
is outside of the frame of the photographs. And every time I found a photograph which was contributing to this notion of a collective history, but that was not known even across borders geographically, which was a fascinating aspect. I mean, obviously, who am I as an American to be stitching between? And I could only do that with a network of, of partners who, who each contributed and took from this project in different ways, in different directions. But I, you know, I'm, I don't know, I, I, I keep thinking about this, um, you know, I obviously began this project in the analog age. So, you know, we're talking about doing this work 30 years ago, 90s. And even the website, which was very experimental in 98, we barely had the capacity to share images digitally. So it's not, it's only more recently that I feel this, that the, the physical artifact is less, uh, the, the thingness is not as important um, as the process that we stitch in and around it. You know, that's, it, but that's not what I could have felt then. You know, what I felt then was that the object was the anchor as an object, but it was still an object of a process. It was a, it was a record of a relationship. Mm. So as much who made the image, because I was trying to trace colonial history, and that is very often outside of the frame, who made the frame? Maybe not as interesting to you in your family photographs, um, but who made the photograph, as well as the event that it tries to portray or the people that are within it. But that is often only traced by families, in fact. It's lost to, and, and it's so interesting, I don't know to what extent you've worked with so-called official archives, the registration process of the appropriation of images into archives is so inadequate. Hmm. So again, we have captioning and titles, maybe we have dates, maybe, but very often the identifications are, are very, uh, have free associations. They don't have the kind of information you were just referring to. Yeah. I mean, I think that what, one thing is definitely for sure is that the physical materiality of the archive or family album or any kind of object that relates to a kind of historical past, especially a difficult historical past, um, is it's it's almost like super important. It's like more important than anything because it, in the in the case of the of Kurdistan, we're talking about a, a displaced nation or a displaced people where nothing almost like nothing exists of that. Um, and in, in which sense the, the materiality of those, of those images, of those photographs or any kind of artifacts associated with that become paramount to what's remaining of that. You know, it, they become really valuable as, as, as the kind of remain, relics of remainders of, of what was once there. Um, yes. And especially and then, with, with such a dispersed, sorry, with a, such a dispersed community around the world, um, I can I can just see how vital those you know the, the existence of those objects are. Yes, and then when that when that show I mean this is the layers of we don't have time for but you know when that show of artifacts goes to Hamburg and is in Germany inside a minority you know what is a minority community in the states of Turkey or Iraq Iran is present in a German diaspora community right. And they see that they exist. They bring their neighbors to acknowledge that, see the photographs stand in for their existence in a way that they, they otherwise have to assimilate into a country that, um, so the identity, the ongoing way in which they continue to hold past present in their ongoing lives is also, there's an interesting tension there. So the artifacts play a role, not just for the families originally, but for the, for a cultural, you know, the imagined community, as we know, the yeah. imagined community that's dislocated and dispersed, and yet has a moment of feeling, not only they were there, they are there, and they are distinct, and they are who they are, right? Yeah. Um, I, so I, I, forms I, that, you know. I have a really, I mean, one, one question I wanted to ask you that, it's, um, that I think that we both share in the sense that there's a, you know, a, as, as kind of, 
as people that kind of mediate within those kind of relationships between images, um, I personally, when I'm working on projects with people, I feel a sense of responsibility towards them and a kind of almost like a sustained responsibility that, that doesn't leave after I finish the project or the commission with the gallery or the museum or whatever, it kind of continues. And because I know that you've been working with the Kurdistan Archive for such a long time and that, you know, you recently re-engaged with participants at Jus de Palm for the, for the exhibition there as well. I'm, I wondered how easy is it or how difficult is it for you to maintain um, and sustain your kind of links with those communities? And have you got others helping you do that? Mm, mm. Um, well, it, you know, the, it's there was a gap only because AK Kurdistan went through 2003 and then ended and the show stopped traveling. So that site specific space was the anchor for the ongoing website. And that sustained for a certain period. When it was re it was reactivated when I did the show as in the, at the Jeu de Pomme, but I had the partner of the Institute of Par of Cur uh, the Kurdish Institute in Paris. So it was an open call as it was in London with a photographer's gallery. Um, and I have, this show is gonna to travel to Berlin in a few months and there'll be again an open call. I, I think the question of the open call is of course it's through networks of connectivity. It might begin with my going to a Kurdish restaurant in Berlin to then say, any of you want to participate? The open, that it has to be that kind of an open, it feels like there's something to contribute either of their lives where they are or the lives that they remember that may be connected to photographs from the past or ongoing images that they make. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the nature of the exchanges are very fluid. Um, and they involve me sitting with other interpreters. I don't speak Kurdish or Farsi or Turkish. And therefore there are, other, there are very often double translations going on as the storytelling begins. Mm -hmm. And then it's trying to find the place where there's a connection between the image and the story that sits, sits outside of it. Yeah. I don't know if that answers, but yeah. it's, fluid. it's fluid. Absolutely. And responsive, which I think must be your process as well. It's responding to the opening and the opportunity to exchange. Thank you so much, Susan and Sunil. It was great to hear how various uh, archival practices has helped you through uh, your journey in photography. And I would like to open the floor now to questions from the audience and the workshop participants. And you can use the Q&A uh, option uh, to type in your questions. And I will just now let the workshop participants come in and see whether they have any questions. When this is happening, maybe uh, Jade, uh, if you want to uh, read out the first question from the Q&A option, that would be great. So, a question from Bada al Balawi: How do you control the quality of the images contributed to your projects? Is there a standardized method to digitize and archive film and printed photos? No, Sunil, you want to? Um, well, that? personally, I. I it's not something I worry about too much. I think um, I, I've, I've digitized with a scanner, but also I even sometimes just re-photograph using my phone and the, the, the image then just becomes circulated online. It doesn't even get printed. So, you know, sometimes, it, it, you know, you, whatever purpose you need to do it for, you can, you, you, you know, you can get around it. It's only when you're like reproducing something for like books or for the wall that you probably need to do something that's more kind of high quality, I would have thought. Yeah, I would just add to that, that um, there is a different choice to photograph an object, to scan an object. And so I, I, um, I photographed as many objects as I could. And I also didn't say this, but I didn't take the objects. It was really important to me to make a record of the object, but the object stayed with the family that contributed it. 
I mean, uh, that's that was sort of that was a key decision, frankly. And if I did borrow an object because there weren't the conditions to reproduce it, um, then I would have returned the object. And the only objects that travel now ongoing with the exhibition are those that were lent to me with that kind of an extended understanding of they would participate in expressing what the project's process had been. Thank you. Um, so of the participants of the course, if anyone would like to ask a question, can you press the raise hand button? Okay, um, Kaveh is raised. Um, would you like to just quickly um, give your name and then ask a question? Hi, my name is Kavalia Brewerton. I'm one of the um, emerging writers in residence. Uh, I think for the both of your works in sort of um, what the archive means, uh, I guess what I'm curious about is it's quite, despite it being also really aesthetically gripping and beautiful, um, it's extremely um, purposeful um, and I guess even has aspects of like being utilitarian or restorative. And I'm just wondering if even though it had such strong intention in um, the means of what the project or investigations were for, did you ever sort of come, um, come into like conflict with the sort of struggle between visualization um, and sort of just showing the issues that are exhibited um, and the, the idea of actualizing the archive and sustaining sort of histories or um, other things that come from your work. Susan, do you wanna go for that one first? Yeah, I would say that one of the most difficult I don't know if this is really speaking to what your, your question is, but one question just now about quality, and this is more about evaluating when you have, and this could be for your own working with your own archive, how you edit, you know, how do you prioritize? And then when you're working with a community, how you're respectful to what might not look like uh, the the images that it's the most um, essential, but it is to a particular person. How do you balance out, this is my grandfather and he was important to an image that doesn't speak to someone else? So I think I worked a lot, it's kind of hidden now in the process, but if you had seen these scrapbooks I showed you, it was filled with post-it notes of other people commenting on the importance of a particular period of time or event or individual. So I was trying to not be the, I was ultimately, of course, the needle stitching through all the elements, but I was trying to open up the process of um, as much as I could, to be as inclusive as I could in that kind of evaluation. I don't know if that's really what you're asking. Um, but of course, my, my priority was always whether or not something could be, was visually engaging to somebody who was not part of the particular photograph or photographic moment. I was, I was involved in a, um, an incident with an image that I, I I actually collected from a, um, a Flickr account, which I had then got permission to use. And it was the uh, archive of a, of, a, of a chap named Jeff Pollard. Um, and he had an image of an accident that had happened on a, on a road in, in, in Uganda. And I used the image as a kind of metaphor for like, you know, kind of trauma and rupture within a slideshow that I had created for the exhibition. Um, and then while the exhibition was on, I had an email from a colleague who'd said that they they didn't never seen that picture before, but they identified the car in the image, and their a family member had been in that accident and had died, um, and it was completely like, you know, didn't realize, you know, like, 
all of a sudden it became this kind of really sensitive issue that was in a public exhibition and you know I just pulled the image you know because it was it was really difficult for them to see that image at the time and to know that it had been used out of context as well um, and obviously the, that wasn't I couldn't foresee that but it was one of those instances where when you're working with histories and working with images in particular and especially in in the way I work with them is that sometimes they you know that when they're outside of their context it can be seen as being disrespectful um depending on what that image is so mm. it's just something that is that is very rare but it, if it happens then you've got to just have the kind of uh you know the ability to kind of deal with that situation and uh, in a respectful way um i in fact i i actually brought the the owner of the picture and the the people whose family was affected by the picture i brought them together because the guy's father who had taken the image um, had died himself in a car crash a few years later um, and the, the two families that brought together so that they could just exchange accounts of what what happened when that actual picture was taken so again it was this kind of the idea of the of what an image means um, has its own life beyond what me or you or anybody else does with it anyway and I think that's really interesting mm. Actually, I was just going to add you. that, you know, not only the image, but especially working with words and words that have histories and words that have histories in time that are revisited by communities, contemporary communities can be even more painful. So for parts of the Kurdish community to read that they were referred to as savages at a particular moment in time by a traveler, let's say, of the 1920s in that scrapbook I showed you. That was the challenge. The question was, do you, and, and there was a debate and we talked about it quite a bit, you know, is it helpful to see, for someone to see how they were being represented in time through the language, not just the image. And so in the end, we decided it was, it was a valuable, they, they were not gonna go into the public records office and find these documents and that if the documents weren't visible to the community, they would never understand a certain piece of their history. So that was very complex to negotiate and only with a community of historians and other members of the community would I have been able to make that decision. Thank you, Susan. And now Abira has a question. Hi, Susan um, and Chanel, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, for you, Susan, um, I was really amazed by the work that you're doing, and I, I guess I'm. I felt like it touched on a lot of the things that I'm interested in, um, particularly around diaspora communities and kind of post-conflict and post-colonial um, states. Um, and so I have an interest in health and well-being, and so I guess I just wondered if you could speak to about the idea of how this work can help communities to rehabilitate um, this idea of. Uh, when there is that fracture and that disruption of war um, and that trauma um, and severing of kind of family familial ties um, or land, how this reconstruction of these images or the bringing together of these images um, can help with a kind of sense of belonging and identity and, and this idea of healing or being able to um, move on from, because I'm from Somalia and so a lot of my work is interested in what these records mean. And you mentioned, you spoke about kind of this idea of bringing together these disparate collections that exist in institutions um, and uh, uh, records that are oft often migrated and how that kind of can leave states feeling slightly untethered and this idea of how you, I don't know, can ground yourself in this work. And so, yeah, I just. Mm. Well, I do, I think actually probably Sunil and I probably would feel in both ways that it's restorative, whether it's for him in relation to his own family history or a community that hasn't seen its own history. I mean, you have to imagine when you don't have a national archive as, you know, the, I don't know, the Bibliothèque Nationale or in my country, the Library of Congress, there's no place to go to find it. So the act of the collective process itself in different, at different layers in different time frames. I think was restorative in a past sense, but is an ongoing um, relationship that changes. You know, in other words, it's 
you know, uh, I mean, I think I had my last trip to Kurdistan was a year and a half ago, and it's almost unrecognizable to the place I was in 1991. So people living in time have different relationships to these photographs of time. So I think somewhere in there is also part of this recovery, restorative and recovery, and it's layers being recovered of different kinds of meanings. So I'm not sure am I answering it in a specific way. Sunil, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I just know that that you know there's a lot. I mean, there's a few people even in the in the participants of this talk that I know that have worked with communities, Andrea and Jagdish being you know uh, good examples where um, you know working with archives, working with communities have been restorative, but also been a forms of kind of like um of of sort of identification or of of like lost light of lost like histories you know um and even marginalization you know and you know kind of recapturing something of culture i mean i think that the example that susan gives particularly with kurdistan is very kind of um is is it, you know there's a lot at stake there with what the what the actual space of you know, working with images does, you know, which can be, you know, to a greater or lesser extent for different um, groups that are working with images. But what I do know is that the, that the, the images do become a place in which conversations can happen and where conversations and dialogue can happen, some useful work is, is, is possible. You know, understanding is possible, learning and growth is impossible. So I think that those things are all kind of ingredients for, um, you know, making, um, this kind of work actually valuable, you know, to, for communities and, and, and ways of actually bringing people together. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I would just add that, I, I, Avira, whether or not you're from a particular community or find yourself organically connecting to a particular community, I think that's the key where that trust comes from. I mean, just because you're of doesn't necessarily mean that you have you have certain kinds of access, but in a very peculiar way, you know, the outsider. I mean, I so much of this book, I felt I was able to represent the representations, you know, and that's really the reason I could feel any grounding, you know, because it wasn't accessible to the community itself. And so bringing back parts of a history that are unknown, you know, you can do that in many, many different ways. But I don't, I would never as assume the right to do it without the kind of relationships that are embedded in the process. To say that, yeah, sometimes being a part of the community, some things are more visible, but actually I think also some things are more hidden as well. And my ability then to, um, I wouldn't say I represent the, my community, but yeah, I think it's, it can be tricky. It's not as, um, I don't often necessarily have the, the right necessary to do this work, but um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that's an interesting word, the notion of the right to, because I think Sunil said something that I would have said too, is it's the responsibility you take on in the process. Um, and, you know, uh, you constantly have to ask that question, you know, what are you contributing, you know, from whichever point of the journey begins? Thank you, Susan. We will just take a last question from Rojda and we will wrap it up afterwards. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for Susan. So I'm also very interested in the Kurdish archive and more so in family photo albums and personal pictures. Because I think, as you said, when you don't have a national museum or you don't have national rituals or, I don't know, national statues, what have you, then I think family photo albums or just personal pictures become very important and can become important to Kurdish people at large, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing recently and just going through my personal photo albums I've come across very beautiful things that I would love to, I don't know, share or research on or write on. 
but then you know I, I was just wondering how the best way is to go about that because at the same time this is something that I want to share with Kurdish people at large but at the same time these are very personal pictures like recently I shared them on a social media site and someone else reshare them on an Instagram page of you know of Kurdish history no context no names no reference to me just as mm. random pictures and I was like well I didn't mean for that to happen so I was wondering if there's a particular way that I should go about it any format or just a platform that would be the best way because I am very interested in this topic but I haven't really thought a lot about the ethical aspect of it. Boy, that's, that's, we could spend a long time on that question. I'm sure Sunil too. I mean, that's, I look back and I think about, I initially thought AKA Kurdistan was possible because it was in cyberspace. So it was outside of any boundaries of any state and any of those limitations. And so I imagined it in that way, but it found, it turned out to be destroyed multiple times. It was attacked, etc. And yet the, the physical object and the relationship of gathering a physical object, once it gets transformed, I think you have to understand it's, it's, it's lost. It's not, it, it can't be controlled. And so the, this question, I think maybe Sunil has a, another idea of how to accept the decontextualization. I'm always trying to recontextualize. I'm least comfortable with precisely what you're talking about because I feel the responsibility to the image that either was collected or that I might have made or the person who's given it to me, all of these, I feel like it's a, it's a break with the, the social contract that I have from the very beginning. So I don't have the answer to how you protect it. Um, Sunil, what would you say? I mean, I, that's, that's the reason, one of the reasons why certain things that can't be said through the, you know the breaking of a social contract or you know sensitivities around images that's why as an artist I take them outside of the the register of like you know visual truth or objectivity or you know provenance and all of those things you know artistic work becomes a site in which to challenge you know in which to sort of break away from the norms in which we might um you know uh work with images and their kind of relationships with you know with others um, and so as an artist, personally, that's that's what I do. I, I, re I move outside of that sphere completely in order to say what can't be said. Um, and I think that's possibly an, an approach. But I, I, I understand the, the difficulty of, of, of these kind of, um, you know, of, of deciding where to work or where to position oneself in relation to that. And, you know, I mean, stuff that I've done is like nothing on the scale of what, Susan, you've been, you know, grappling with you know, as to what these images mean to a group of people, you know, to this kind of displacement and, you know, complete marginalization from, from a region. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, um, Roger, but a good question. Thank you for everyone uh, for their question. And, and I'm very sorry we cannot get to all of you, but we will be sharing this recording uh, soon with all of the participants and all of the uh, attendees. Uh, so thank you very much for spending the time with us. And we cannot wait to see what the six participants come up with uh, during the five le a week uh, program that we are having. And have a nice uh, day, everyone. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. The bottom line is don't assume, ask. Thanks. And re ask and rethink and, and always ask more. There are more questions than answers. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.